Hey, hey, I'm AG. Welcome to this week's blog. Well, this week I want to talk a little bit about why did we choose or why do I choose the MX Rebreather and so forth. I've got a lot of questions, some magazine interviews and so forth, some book interviews about, you know, answering these questions. So I thought rather than write to the editor, what I would do is I would make a blog that kind of talks about it. But before we jump into the Rebreather section, I want you to take a look around and see that I love shooting blogs when we're on location. This week, the location I'm coming to you from is from South Korea. I'm actually here on the research vessel uh, RV Erdo. Erdo is a mystery island and it's kind of fitting because this project is for the Korean government. So the problem is, is I really can't talk a lot about the project. I can't advertise the project. I can't tell you, hey, we went here, we did this. So what I can tell you is it's in the East China Sea and it's in a very sensitive area. And as you can see, we'll be using the MX rebreather right here, as I'm going to introduce to you and show you. And we're going to be using a selection of our gases. And you can see that our gases are oxygen for decompression, nitrox 21, uh, nitrox 21, nitrox 50, 21 meter bottle, 36 meter bottle, 57, 57 meter bottle. And of course, to drive the rebreather, we'll be driving it with 1070. That should give you pretty much a good idea of the range of depth that we'll be diving in. I'm not going to say I'm not allowed to, and I'm not going to say when, I'm not going to say why, but it definitely gives you a basic idea of the project. Yes, these are mainly Bela. Each diver is carrying, as you can see, six bottles. Those six bottles are really mainly Bela. With the rebreather, we use very little. We'll be out diving for the entire two weeks, and we'll be doing a lot of research work in those depths, and a lot of work for the Korean government. Anyway, so, back to the topic at hand. So the question that people ask me is, why did you choose MX or, you know, it, you know, the editor is writing a book about all different types of rebreathers and they said, hey Andrew, I want to know why are you using the MX? What was your philosophy? So it's going to be kind of a long blog. It might be, you know, 30, 40 minutes. So dig in and enjoy it. Let's jump right in. So first of all, you have to understand there's two types of rebreathers that you can choose from, really meaning general types. One is called semi-closed, SCR, and the other is called CCR. And in each of those, there's multiple variations. I'm just gonna say, look, I chose CCR, and this is why. For me, I dove the SCR for many years, and I found a lot of the flaws in the SCR concept. SCR stands for semi-closed. Very basically, while you're diving, while you, it's not fully closed, there's a little bit of bubbles coming out the whole time, which means there's, there's constant gas addition in some manner, in some form. Now that constant gas addition has to be a higher PPO style bottom mix. In other words, the idea being is you're replenishing the oxygen that you're both metabolizing. And that replenishment is done through calculation of how much you're getting rid of. And that's, and that's the basis of an SCR. The point is, is this, you're restricted to the MOD of the gas you're adding. So that's one problem. Then of course, because you're metabolizing and because you're using the gas a lot, what happens is the PPO2 is dropping, so you have a PPO2 drop. Hence, the gas you're injecting also has a minimum operating depth. So you've got two problems with the gas. One is a maximum, the other is a minimum, an MOD. Then, of course, because you don't know what the PPO2 is, okay, and it's variable, you basically use the worst of the FO2. What that means is the fraction of oxygen for decompression. So let's say I was diving at 30 meters, 100, uh, yeah, 30 meters, 100 feet, and I was using nitrox 32, for example. What you could not assume is that on, on an SCR, that nitrox 32 at 100 feet, 30 meters, is the 1.2 that you're expecting, give or take, basic math, guys. So the point is, is that because of the PPO2 drop, it could be 1.0, it could be 0.8, it could be so on, so somewhere in there. So the problem is you have to use the fraction of oxygen for decompression, which is the air table. So here you are, diving nitrox 32, you're restricted to the MOD of 33 meters, 111 feet. You're at, you know, you're at 100 feet, 30 meters. You're using the decompression schedule of air. So 20 minutes, if you want NDL. And of course, you've got a minimum operating depth because when you get shallower, let's say you get into six meters, 20 feet, that nitrox 32, which would normally be a PPO2 of, you know, 1.6 times by 33.2, it's not going to be because of the FO2 drop, because of the drop, sorry, the PPO2 drop, the metabolism. So it could be as low as 0.16, it could even be hypoxic. So generally on SCR, you descend and ascend the last meters 
while on open circuit or a much higher PPO2 mix such as Nitrox 50. Not really the point yet. So those were a lot of disadvantages. And one of the big problems with those disadvantages was is that many of the units, and the units specifically that I dove, which was the RB80, which is uh, a version that's called actually a PSEO, it's passive edition, but not really the point. The point was is that we were basically instructed to dive it without an O2 meter, meaning it was not necessary you could do it through calculation. And of course, I never taught that way and I didn't believe that. So I believe and Teal taught that you must have an O2 meter because the idea, of course, is how do you know what your PPO2 is? And the calculation isn't always 100%. So there was a lot of faults that way. And I didn't really like the idea of just sort of, uh, I think the PPO2 is, that's no way to dive, you know, and especially, you know, blind belief. Of course, the PSCR, the downfall there as well, is that it's tied to your breathing. Because it's passively activated, when you inhale and exhale is when it gets rid of the gas. In other words, when you inhale, it gets rid of a little bit of gas. And then, of course, when you exhale, and then when you inhale, it activates and adds the gas, and it gets rid of a little bit of more gas. The problem is, is of course, if there's a failure in that system, that Achilles heel there, is that little diaphragm on the inner counter lung. It doesn't get rid of gas, now all of a sudden, your PPO2 is dropping, it's not adding, and you've got problems. Besides that, it's tied to your RMV. So in higher currents, when you're fighting, when maybe you're in a bit more of a stressful situation, you breathe more, you use more gas, it basically turns into open circuit. You're using so much gas. When you're a much better diver, calm, quiet, cool, collected, and you're sort of just hanging out, of course, the PPO2 drops massively because you're not adding a lot of gas, you're not getting rid of a lot of gas. So there's all these really variables. So I always insisted on O2 sensors. But once you agree to O2 sensors, once you say, you know what, I have to have an O2 sensor. I don't like the idea of not knowing my PPO2. I don't know the idea of not knowing my FO2 for decompression. I don't like the idea that I'm just relying on this mechanical action to happen. If it doesn't happen, uh, yeah, I should be listening, but you know, who knows if it is or isn't. Point is, once you add the O2 sensors, all of a sudden you go, geez, you know what? I might as well make it a closed circuit degree. I might as well make it a CCR because then not only can I improve my ratios, remember on the SCR, you're getting four to one, five to one, six to one if you're a great diver. Really, I promise you, no matter what anybody tells you, six to one was, what, was a really good diver. Point is, is now you can get 100 to one on a CCR, even if not more. You know, the ratios, it's incredible, it's crazy, meaning of gas consumption. You really do not use any gas. The only gas you use is the oxygen metabolized, which is right around 20 liters per minute. But that's another argument. So the point is, is that I didn't choose SCR when I was able to basically move into my own agency, UTD, and then develop a CCR for me, and then develop a training program around that. So and my belief has always been, once you add those O2 sensors, you basically can do closed circuit. Because now you can close up the loop, no more bleeding, and you can just add the O2 you need. Hence, that's the difference. Now, that doesn't mean I didn't learn a lot about SCR diving and about how to add these gases into the mix if I wanted to make the MX eventually as a bailout SCR, which you can. So the MX, the beautiful part is you can dive at CCR, you can dive at SCR, just as easy. It's really, really simple. So the point is, you'll see a lot of the bleed over from the RB80 into the MX, where you can plug in various gases, making it an SCR as well. Or you don't have to, you can just dive at pure CCR. And no, there's no mechanical switch. I don't believe in any of that stuff. You, the diver, control everything. That's the point. So, let's jump into CCR. So, I chose CCR. Why did I choose CCR? And in that, which one did I choose? Well, in the CCR family, there's really two thoughts. And then I took one and made it my variation. Meaning, there's one which says, well, there's three maybe. Let's call it. So, there's one that's pure CCR. I allow all electronics to figure out and add through solenoid gases to the CCR and mix my gas for me. And basically, I turn it on autopilot, don't use my brain, and hopefully I survive. I do not agree with that. I do not agree with that whatsoever. All right? It's, it's really, it's so far from our philosophy of diving. Just look at ratio deco. We don't just rely on some computer to tell us what our decompression schedule is. We actually know, understand our decompression, use our head thinking diver, and we calculate our decompression on the fly. That's the unique uh, thing to UTDs. We teach thinking divers, who, and it goes all the way from our gas management rock bottom, 
all the way to you know working out our decompression on the fly while we're diving we know we're working our decompression so the point is that's very different from sort of just strapping on a computer and relying on whatever it says and if you believe it great and if you don't well you, know, you could be bent so anyways to continue so we took a very hard stance. I don't believe in electronics. I don't believe in solenoids. Yes, they could stick open, inject O2 when you don't, when you, when you don't want it, blah, 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 blah. And one of the main reasons that I don't like uh, fully electronic rebreathers is again, because you become a dumber diver. You become a not as aware. You are not as in tune with the rebreather. For example, I've seen a lot of people get hurt on CCRs, specifically on, uh, on the electronic ones, because they'll jump in, forget to turn on the O2, for example, the rebreather still functions, the computer is trying to inject the O2, but it's not injecting O2, the ADV has added the gas that you want, and so you're breathing diluent on the surface, and so you got hypoxic, and so you go to sleep. On a fully mechanical or MCCR like I have, this, the fully manual unit, we have an intrusive alarm. If you jump in and forget to turn your oxygen on, so to speak, or you forget to turn on any one of those bottles, the rebreather doesn't work. You go because it's it's fully manual. That's why you have to add the gas. No computer adds it for you. So you push in the button and it's not adding the oxygen. So you go, boom, you can't breathe. It. And you won't have an ADV or a solenoid that's adding diluent to create false. Number one, sound that something is adding. But number two, false sense that there's gas in the bag to breathe. Remember, you have to add the diluent. It doesn't add diluent for you. So again, the breathing bag won't breathe. So you don't, you're not getting a false feeling like, yes, there's gas in the lungs to breathe, but it's not breathable gas. And you're so distracted and you're so trying to swim to the bow and you're trying to carry your camera and hold a pulse spear or whatever you're trying to do. And so you can't read the, the PPO2 on your meter or you don't or you forget to, it doesn't matter. So your lights go out. We don't have that issue. If I jump in and forget to turn on my O2, I cannot breathe the rebreather. Right? I just can't because I haven't pushed the button. If I push the button, there's nothing there to give. There's no false gas. So, I'm, and so of course I switch to, to, to you know, to the, the the BOV, so to speak, the open circuit, and then try to figure out what the hell's going on. Anyway, so again, I've just seen too many people getting hurt. Accidents happen on fully closed rebreathers that are centered around completely electronic. That way I chose MCCR. Now, in the MCCR family, there's MCCR where they have some kind of a copus or constant oxygen partial injection system, or leaky valve, where it kind of leaks a little bit of O2 into the system. And again, I dove and tried that for a long time and I have a lot of negatives on it. So in part two of this, when we come back, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk about why within the MCCR section, we chose to go pure manual and not to have a leaking valve. So see you when we come back.